Uh, since we're running ahead of schedule, President Clark is going to take us next to um, approving revisions to the volunteer vaccination policy. The materials are at page 31. Uh, who from that small group is going to present on this? I think, <clears throat> sorry, I have a hard time talking this morning, too much talking last night. <clears throat> I believe that will be me, actually. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. The uh, proposed the memo regarding the rescinding of the volunteer vaccination policy um, can be found in your materials on page 31. I was <clears throat> part of a small group with um, Paris Erickson, Kevin Fay, Glennis Kleinfelter, so um, Kevin Plachy and Brian Tolufson, who met to discuss um, whether the vaccination policy should be rescinded. This was discussed at our last meeting in a small group. It was decided would gather. Uh, our recommendation at this time is to rescind the volunteer vaccination policy and approve the proposed framework to support the executive director's role and authority regarding health and safety policies and procedures. Um, one of the things that we discussed at the last meeting and has become evident is that as of October 31st, the um, Supreme Court has rescinded their vaccination policy and this um, board has pretty much the whole time of, at least in the last year of establishing a vaccination policy has done so to coincide with what the Supreme Court has done. Um, so we believe that at this time, because the vaccination policy has been rescinded by the board of, or excuse me, the Supreme Court, that it would be within um, the view of this group that it be rescinded and that um, Executive Director Nevitt be able to um, within her roles and responsibilities as executive director, um, not only rescind it, but also create any kind of new policy that um, may need to go into effect given changing conditions in the future. That's the presentation for now. I'm available for questions as is. Um, Kevin Plachy is available as well by Zoom. Okay, Jordan. How well does your proposal comply with the uh, the newest uh, like Supreme Court rules. Well, I guess that that, that dire executive director Nevitt would have to <laughs> formulate um, something that would go in line with that. I believe the plan would be that um, there would be postings on the website and at all meetings that um, people are encouraged to wear masks as they are able to. They're encouraged to be vaccinated, but there's no actual policy, WISBA policy, that mandates either of those things in order to attend a function. I mean, I would point out that for the last two days, none of us have been wearing a mask. So, um, but that being said, I I believe in reading the Supreme Court opinion that that's what they were doing to the courts, encouraging the courts as well as to make it clear that people are not to discriminate against people that are wearing masks and who may or may not be vaccinated, but there is otherwise no policy um, to require the wearing of masks or being vaccinated. Serena. Um, just a question regarding the executive director's authority with respect to developing new policies for in-person meetings. Is that, this is just a point of clarification, is the guidance or you're asking us to weigh in on um, her ability to create new policy for any health and safety guidelines or just for COVID-19? I just, I just want to understand the scope. Uh, Director Plachy. <laughs> I think I can help answer that. We were tasked with the with the task, with the mandate of going and making a recommendation as to the volunteer and attendee policy. So in my view, at least, and I, the other work group members can weigh in, I think this is limited to a recommendation around the vaccination and attendee policies related to COVID. Tara, next. I'll jump into, I wasn't a part of the small group, um, 
But, you know, in my view, I think the executive director already has authority over health and safety policies, which is not to say that the board doesn't also have the ability to adopt policies. And so I think given that the board chose to adopt a policy in this realm, I think in rescinding it, it could be unclear whether or not the executive director then has authority to adopt a similar policy. So I think it is a good idea to clarify what the board's intent is in rescinding this policy. Alec. So I, I guess I'm wondering what happens in the interim? What guidance do we give? Do people just do whatever they want to do? Um, because now we're in, I mean, if we pass, if we, we rescind all of these things, there's nothing in the breach for some indeterminable time. Um, and, and, and perhaps um, we will see how even nationally this experience goes as we go into, as they say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming where we will then be, I mean, just as a nation back in close quarters, some people wearing masks, some people don't. I have more of a, a leap of faith that most of us are vaccinated and I'm, I'm triple boosted, but I still have to wonder, you know, in that interim time, whatever that is, is it just kind of, do your own thing or is there any guidance to be given? So I, I have a suggestion, which would be that perhaps the board rescind this policy with like a date two weeks out and that would give us time to adopt policies. So we wouldn't have an interim policy. So we, the board could say, for example, we're going to rescind this effective November 15th or some other date. Uh, and then I'll work with my team to make sure that we have policies in place before that expires. Brent. I think that if we're inclined to be reversing and rescinding this policy that we should um, give an appropriate amount of time so we don't have interim, but also be cognizant that sections and whatever may be having uh, uh, festive holiday gatherings burning of winter solstice bushes, festivist trees, whatever. And so um, we should do it in a time that gives the executive director enough time to create the policy. But I would strongly recommend that we don't say like December 31, because that's just easy at the end of the year, because then we're going to have a whole slew of members that are going to be getting together and not knowing what the rule is that they should be complying with. Lauren. Thank you. I just have a clarification question. So I believe there's two policies, right? There's the policy that the executive director put in place and then the policy the Board of Governors put in place. So is the recommendation that we just rescind the policy that we put in place and then, I guess, reaffirm the executive director's authority uh, that she can has the authority to do what she will with her policy based on what she thinks is best? Or are we recommending to her that both policies be rescinded? I guess, are we directing the executive director to do something that she has authority to do without us? If that makes sense. Brent. That's a good question. Thank you, Governor Morgan. I will, I will say that to me, I think that it would be most appropriate and, and, and with history as our guide to rescind our policy and to allow the executive director <laughs> the immediate authority, because if something does happen as to borrow from Governor Stevens and winter comes and brings a really nasty situation and we don't have five days notice to have a special board meeting with a, another policy that I believe that we empower the executive director to do that, knowing that we can always come back at another meeting and reassert a new policy that we've discussed. But given that we have seen how fluid um, COVID-19 has been, and now COVID-19 with the flu with RSV. I mean, if anyone's watched Good Morning America in the last week, you know they're calling it this triple threat, especially towards children. And so I 
personally am in a p point where I would like the organization and association to be as nimble as possible to allow as much um, engagement and volunteerism and participation as possible, but really just giving it to the executive director is where I would where I would fall. Thank you. Lauren. And I agree with that. I just want to make sure that we're not saying, well, the executive director had authority to put her policy in place. Now we're going to rescind her policy and that that would translate to other sort of um, <clears throat> operational decisions. I just don't want to get involved in her operational decisions. So I wanted to ensure that this was not that, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, just, I think the minute should make clear, we do not want to imply that Executive Director uh, Nevitt does not have emergency authority for health and safety. Um, she does. Uh, I would note for the for the minutes that that is in place, and if she wants to rescind her policy, she can do that, and I, I believe that's the plan. But um, we shouldn't meddle in her kitchen, in my opinion. Well, one of the things that I am very interested in is making sure whatever we whatever you bring forward is a unitary policy for everyone as opposed to differences based on volunteers staff and others but that everybody understands what the either rules of the game or the guidance of the game are uh and not pick and choose between what may even may be conflicting policies and i think that's your that that's the task in front of you so thank you well and to respond to you governor stevens one of the big topics that we did discuss in creating this recommendation is that <clears throat> because there were two policies for both volunteers and attendees it was causing a lot of um extra time on the staff to have to either gather the information ahead of time or figure out what they're going to do at the event. And so I am fully confident that whatever policy is created here on out will be unilateral for everyone across the board because they don't want the hassle of trying to figure out is it an attendee or a volunteer. Okay, so as a, as a one, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm then made yet or motion. yeah. We need it, a motion. Yeah. So if I can make the motion, I would make the motion that we rescind um, the volunteer vaccination policy that we created, and mm -hmm. that it be effective Friday, November eighteenth, which would give um, Director Nevitt and her staff. Um, two full weeks to create a new policy. This is coming from a committee of the board presenting to the board. I don't think we need a motion, but I might be wrong. Well, I think it's just an up and down. We do vote. need a motion, I think. We do need a motion? Yeah, yeah. I think because it's, it's like something passed already, right? So, so, so in said. that case, to move things forward, I will second it so that we can keep going. Okay. There's one made, I one seconded. Any, um, our, 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 Brent, your hand was up or? Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, Lauren. Do we need to include a, a reaffirmation of the executive director's authority to take emergency action when it's health and safety or is that clear? That's clear to me as a, with you guys as well. Okay. All right, then hearing no more discussion, let's vote then. Governor Ottawale? Aye. Governor Angelville? Governor Boyd? Aye. Governor Couch? Aye. Governor Dresden? Aye. Governor Fay? Aye. Governor Kading? Aye. Governor Wynn? Aye. Governor Petrasic? Aye. Governor Pertzer? Governor Rathbone? Aye. Governor Sayani? Aye. Governor Stevens? Aye. Governor Williams Ruth? Aye. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, we're still way ahead of schedule. Um, 
Should we move up the uh, around the table now to next? Okay, round table, guys. Um, okay, um, so, yeah, with you. I would love to start with some very exciting and happy news. Um, so I have the privilege of chairing this small town and rural practice, the STAR committee this year, taking over after um, President-elect Abel's wonderful year of starting it. Um, while we were at our retreat yesterday, um, I received the exciting news that one of our committee members who had applied to the governor's office for this um, about three months ago, it just came yesterday, the governor has signed a proclamation establishing November 15th Rural Practice Day. Okay, Alec. So it's a pleasure to be with you in person. Um, but I'm I'm making a point of personal privilege. Um, and I want my fellow governors to understand that we all have different ways in which we deal with this pandemic. Um, my lovely bride is a dialysis patient and I am her primary caregiver. So it becomes very difficult for me um, to always be here in person. When I became a governor, I think at least half of our meetings were in Seattle. And for me, and I'm saying this is a point of personal privilege, I may be one of the few governors who live in the city of Seattle or near the city of Seattle. It's much easier for me to manage my other personal responsibilities when we are meeting in Seattle. My request, especially if we have an additional retreat, et cetera, et cetera, is that those things be considered. I heard comments regarding Zoom yesterday. I am a strong believer in hybrid, hybrid um, approaches so that people who may not be able to be physically present can still be present. And actually, it, Zoom is a far better approach than uh, those of you who were here in the, in the dark ages where we had a speakerphone box in the middle of the table. And that was the only way people who could not be present at our meetings, wherever they were, could participate, unlike now. And so while I appreciate the idea that it is so important to be together, I just want to ask you all to understand when I may have to opt out. Um, I was able to make arrangements to do this, and I'm going to look at our, our calendar and with prior planning, certainly, for example, we generally, I think in July, have a retreat. And by the way, I am the uh, titular uh, chair of the Seersucker Society and the Aloha Day participation, and I hope to be with you and to work those things out. But I would ask that if we have additional meetings, that serious consideration be given to coming to Seattle, where a goodly portion of our membership also either work or reside. So I thank you. And um, like I said, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and I'm taking a leap of faith. I'm not wearing a mask, but like I said, I'm, I'm triple boosted. 
and have my flu shots and everything. Um, but those are the things that I have to take in consideration. And so when I can't be with you, I want you all to understand why that is so. Thank you, Nick Bell. Thank you, Mr. President. And following on Governor Stevens, I will say that I was disappointed to find out that there wasn't going to be a hybrid option until Wednesday. I understand, and again, I have advocated for the need for the in-person meeting, especially for retreats. And I reached out to a couple governors myself, asking them, did, did you know this was going to be retreat only or in-person only? Because we as a board had previously adopted the idea that anything we did would be hybrid. And so that was a surprise. Then yesterday in our retreat, in one of the inappropriate listed items of ambush or surprise, we started the meeting with an ambush and surprise that we couldn't have our computers on. We couldn't do what we've done for the time I've been on this board, which is multitask. And, you know, again, not going into the reasons for it, if we're going to be changing the way we do things, which I would support, it would be nice to know not at the start of a meeting that all of a sudden the work I was planning on doing through yesterday and people I told would be available. And yes, they would get a response back to me if they got something to me and I would be able to respond. That that is a consideration because that is what has been the norm since I've been on this board. And people, you know, and, and it happens. We are volunteers with jobs. There are governors who were in mediations. There were governors who had hearings. You know, and, and the fact that we were, to me, again, I, I got no notice that all of a sudden tomorrow was going to have to be a 100% bog designated day. It was just really ironic to me that we're starting with a norm that says we don't like surprises and ambush. And yet that's exactly how, in my feeling, that's how we started the day. So my only ask is that if we're going to change what the norm is, that that come to us in a timely fashion so that way we can make adjustments. In that same vein, and, and there was a small window of opportunity to have said it yesterday and it was missed. But one of the things that I would like us to change as a norm is how we schedule our meetings. And I don't mean the BOG meetings. I, I mean the um, committee meetings where we don't have set dates. Because right now, my norm is when I get a staff email and it has a doodle poll in it. I try to respond immediately to get a response into them. That I have my BOG email on my phone and I get a little ding and I see, ah, Paris Erickson has sent a doodle poll. She wants to know availability for X meeting or Glynis Kleinfelter or whoever. I find myself frequently being one of the very first to respond. And there's 27 times that are being held. But then there's not a decision made for a week or a month or longer. And then the meeting gets made and guess what? I'm no longer available. And so I had, I had sent a request to Director Nevitt that we change our protocol where every time we have a doodle poll that's sent, it says this poll will close Tuesday at five o'clock. And that we make it as a norm that no matter how busy we are, we will check our BOG emails at least once a week or something so that way there can be a better system. Because for those of us who are trying to schedule around our participation in events and meetings and sections 
and liaisonships and committees and task force and councils that we have a way, because if I knew that the poll ended at five o'clock on Wednesday, I would go in at 4.30 on Wednesday. I would, I would put a reminder into my calendar. Check my calendar at four o'clock, respond to Tara's email. And I would go and give a most recent, current and accurate saying, okay, these are the times. Because it's, to me, unreasonable for me to hold 27 meeting potential times, not scheduling clients, not scheduling other meetings, holding that for an indeterminate amount of time. And so I would hope that the, the Board of Governors would support such a move as a new norm, so that way we can all have a better grasp of when we're saying, yes, I'm available, or no, I'm not, and understanding that it's not going to be open-ended for a week or more at a time. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Any uh, um, others? <clears throat> 